Hello, this is Don Hall, and I am in Oakland, California, with my best bud, Susanna Israel. And we're in her studio, and she's going to demonstrate for us how she made this cool rabbit uh, reading a book. Say hello, Susanna. Hello, and thank you, Don, for coming to the studio and making it possible for us to have a record of how this creature got created. I'm going to make a rabbit sitting in an armchair and reading a book. The rabbit's going to be wearing glasses. The name of the book is R is for Rabbit. And I always start with a sketch. The clay that I'm working here is a cone 10, beautiful brick red sculpture clay. It's a fairly new clay from Laguna Clay Company. And it actually was formulated from the very same body as the Mission Clay Arts and Industry terracotta sewer pipes that so many artists have been able to go carve and paint in their residency. And I still have that residency going in Arizona. So this is a beautiful clay. I fire it to about cone two, and um, around here in the studio, you'll probably catch some pictures later of the finished look of the clay. It's very, very pretty. Now these slabs I've just sliced off so roughly are gonna be the armchair. And since I'm working with wet clay, I need some support for that. Fold them over here. This one on the back. One of the things that happens a lot with people working with clay, especially for the first time, but also, you know, the last time you did it, is that we start out and we'll you'll see something that isn't necessarily going to be at all what we have when we finish. So when teaching and also when I'm in the studio, I'll remind myself, um, you know, don't, don't assume that this is what you're going for. Put the clay where you want it. And then after that, you can shape it. So this might not look like much of an armchair to anybody else. But to me, it's already getting the form that I want it to. And again, these finger marks, the impressions that our hands make in clay are pretty magical. You know, everybody who touches clay makes a mark different from what anybody else would ever make when they touch clay. So there's a lot of reason to think about keeping those spontaneous marks in some way. Um, that being said, these marks are probably going to change quite a bit because at this point in time, I'm not really interested in getting the texture of these slabs right. I'm interested in getting them to hold together and hold up for this sculpture. So they're probably going to change quite a bit. So if you see something you love and then it disappears, I'm sorry. <laughs> all right, so all of this is so that I can get on with the real deal, if you will, which is the rabbit. It's possible to work this way and have your sculpture stand up, but it's a pretty wobbly affair. Clay is really saturated with water. It's really, it's wet, it's heavy. So that's part of why I'm going to have this rabbit supported by this chair. Oops. I think it's Beverly Mayeri who says of her work that the key thing that we look at in any kind of piece that has a face is the face and at the eyes. So I'm going to start with the head and face of this rabbit. So that's really going to let me know, you know, who's here, who we're getting to meet, who we're dealing with. I'm going to shape the nose. Oh, I'm a sculptor raised on the potter's wheel. There are quite a lot of us. Michelle Greger is another, a wonderful Bay Area figure sculptor, and a friend of mine. And we started out in pottery because there was really nowhere else to go to learn about clay. And I'm very glad I did. I love throwing on the wheel. I still do it. 
Um, for years, I taught a summer throwing class, 16 years in a row, in fact. And I'm a pretty good potter, as it happens. But most of what I love about throwing is how it feels when I sit down at the wheel. Maybe your piece doesn't turn out great. Maybe it doesn't get perfectly centered. But there's something about being at the wheel that, that centers the person, I think. And I love that part. So, because of my potter's background, I work hollow. And because of the lessons I learned from various teachers like Byron Temple, lucky me, my first class at Pratt Art Institute was with Byron Temple, his master, and um, David Karoka, Cleo Ferguson in Cleveland, it's not that well known. Um, the idea of making sure that your piece really looked like it had some life by getting your textures and pushing them out from the inside. It happens fast, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to let this sit for a moment. It's a little big. Look at the back. I'm not gonna see the back much. So this forming that I'm doing, it doesn't look much like working on the potter's wheel, but it's very much the same in that I'm using my fingers against my palms with the clay inside uh, between them so that I can tell how thick it is and so that I can get a shape that, you know, as you see, is somewhat rounded. There's all kinds of names for this. My favorite is thumb stitching. I didn't actually ever get any terms when I first started doing it, but that seems to be the most common. That belly out there. The, one of the pieces in the recent persistent innovations show scribe has a belly that's made that way that's a much larger piece so uh, the belly is about this big and I really like the fact you can see it in the show that on that piece the belly form here was applied and attached but not all the way so that you can see the crack where it peels out a little at the top okay now Temporary supports. I want this to stay where it is. So I'm going to attach the back of the chair to the back of the rabbin with this temporary support. There's quite a bit of work left to be done. This is a good size. This rabbit's been eating good and regular. So I'm thinking about volume, I'm thinking about curving this around, thinking about a kneecap and lower leg. If this were going to be freestanding, I'd come around with another slab as I did for the front and back of the body to um, fill it in. Just how much volume do I want? I really wanted that leg like that. We're absolute rulers in this universe. It may not feel like it all the time. Just remember, you're the one. Okay. Now at this point, this lovely head is just not happening unless I want something really distorted, so. 
Goodbye to that head. And there's another thing that I like to do. And I want to show you the detail really carefully. So let me sit back down and really get close to it. All right. Let's get this rabbit head more in proportion. I'll use my fingers as an armature temporarily here. Rabbits are something called rhinoencephalons, which means nose brain. And if you've ever had a pet rabbit or a petted one, you know that at the top of their skull, there's actually a groove. They have like a negative brain. <laughs> and that's because almost all of the information they process comes from their noses. So they've got good long noses here. One of the things that I look for, kind of like taking direction from almost, are the textures that happen while I'm working on the form, but I may find something that really has an expression to it. And when that happens, I try to preserve what it is that I've got and then replicate it. So this is pretty subtle, admittedly, but because of that line and the clay underneath it, and the hollow that's occurred, there's an expression to that that looks like the expression from an eye, even though we don't have empty sockets. I'm gonna to try to do that again on the other side, which means that I'm pressing the clay out from inside, pushing in with a finger, and then you have to do this with a lot of control, pushing the hollow out again. There. So although these aren't identical, I feel like they've got the same, um, the same expression, the same kind of mood to them. And I'm going to do my best not to mess this up as I finish the rest of the head. This is where timing's really important. Obviously for this video we're going quick uh, to, to evolve this form and to get our rabbit done. And so, you know, it's always possible to come back when the clay is less pliable and do a lot of refining there. Okay, so rabbits have a divided lip. Put the clay on to emphasize that. And this kind of round little mouths at the sides. I'm not trying to do an anatomically correct rabbit, obviously, but I want it to look like a rabbit and not a deer or something. So we've got that. And again, more refining can and probably definitely will happen. So the rabbit's looking down at the book, pay some attention to getting this neck ready. As much as possible, I don't want to trap air here, so I'm sticking my finger in here and go pretty deep to make sure to open up this hollow. So I'm going to put a coil where it attaches. Obviously, no matter how much clay I use at this point to attach the head, I'm going to need some help to keep it in position. Okay, so we're going to depend on that, these little lumps of clay under the chin to hold it here. this point I'm 
It's an interesting question. What kind of ears does this rabbit have? Because to begin with, in my sketch, obviously, I was thinking about having the ears upright. Now it seems to me that having them move down and the position and expression here is going to work a lot better to suggest that the rabbit's concentrating on what it's looking at. This is really very typical of the way that I work. I'll have an idea and I'll pretty much really explore the permutations of that idea. Make a book. There's so many ways to make books. So I'm intending to indicate that these are lines of writing. Pages. Someone else might think that this was really inadequate and that you needed to have an accurate number of pages that, you know, there are a number of things about its realism or lack of realism that could be a concern. But I think that one of the things that happens when we do something often, and we make a lot of books because I read a lot of books, is that uh, we make up our own conventions. You know, we do something the way that we always do that something. So this is going to be this rabbit's book. Shoulder there. One more shoulder here. And on the other side. I love the way just that is a shoulder there. And then you get away with just tucking this hand right under the book. There's one thing we all know that's important to a rabbit, it's its feet. They're gonna have to be pretty powerful looking. The upright ears have won the day here. Maybe not entirely as big as this. This one, it's more important to have this because we're going to see it here. It's not so important. Let's start with the most important foot. 
I really like these and a lot of people have already observed that I like to leave those edges shown. So I think this foot is just right, but it's below the line here. So rather than edit a piece, an element that I think really has the personality of a rabbit foot and for this piece, I'm gonna leave that and add more base. So this is the marvel of clay. <laughs> you, can do, you can change some of your ideas to fit the idea that's evolving in front of you, but that seems like a better way of doing it. Well, if you took this rabbit to the vet, you might get yourself locked up in a charge of rabbit abuse because it has such a strange physique, but we don't have to worry about this. All right, now, I still like the idea of putting spectacles, glasses on this rabbit. So I'm going to do that. Along the way here of making the piece, it's already begun to strike me that I'm not sure that that's going to be something that I will prefer to the way that this face looks now. So the spectacles might end up being removed at some point. kind of fulfills the concept and I do like it so it wins all right so to distinguish the pages on this book which I've done with a serrated tool so that's already kind of an abstraction I'm going to go over them with white slip In my way of thinking the white is the page uh, the terracotta lines stand for print and to make sure your texture really stands out, as most people know, I think, you want to go across the top, hitting the raised elements as much as you can, ideally exclusively, but then there's reality. Now I've also got the pages here, so I'm going to do the same thing along the sides of the and the ends of the book. And as quick as that seems, that is all that you need. After Susanna finished building the rabbit reading the book, we had a discussion regarding the use of a plan or a sketch when she begins and then changes her mind as she works, especially when using multiple parts that can be moved around. Here are her thoughts. What, the world's most complex piece. It had 12 chickens, three figures in costumes, um, larger than life size. The thing was magnificent and it was a nightmare because when it came time to assemble it to present it to my grad committee, I thought, well, the chickens can go out like this. No, wait, they should be all in a group around the hand with the corn. No, the hand, person with the hand with the corn should be in the middle and the other two should be looking. No, they, and finally I thought, I'm just gonna set it up the way that I first made it. And after that hideous five hour experience, I thought, you know what, I make, I don't have rules, but I have this rule. If I made it a certain way, and there are all these elements that are supposed to gather, go together in that way, there will be no better way. And at the end of the day, I'm gonna go back to it anyway. So don't go there. Ha, ha, ha.